Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the WellBe podcast and show. I am very excited to have my special guest today, Dr. Boyana Weatherly. She's a friend of mine, a lovely person, and she's also a doctor, double board certified in internal medicine and integrative medicine. Today, she is going to be speaking about the role of mindfulness in healing chronic illness and also just preventing it, um, and also the role in of stress rather and mindfulness and immunity and how they're all so intimately connected, um, especially during this time of extreme uncertainty about coronavirus or COVID-19 and how we are all going to you know, react should we be exposed? Are we going to be in critical condition? Are we going to be asymptomatic or something in the middle? And a lot of you know, what happens to us um, depends a great deal on our immunity and also our stress response uh, to that virus. So, Boyana, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, doing this. And I'm so happy to be here and talk about these such important topics that affect us all right now more than ever. Yes, they really, really do. It's wild how much mindset and our thinking Um, And the anxiety, it just, it affects you physically so much. I mean, we know this from the research, which you'll get into in in depth today, but even just a few days ago, it was pouring rain where I am the whole day, pouring rain. And uh, my husband and I were watching the news most of the day and which I kind of hadn't been doing. um, And, you know, just press conference after report, after press conference, after update and just the numbers and the, and by the time I went to bed that night, I could not sleep, um, which very rarely happens to me. I never have sleep issues really. Um, And just was totally, I could just feel physically a difference in my body. And it was, it was wild. So my first question for you is how did mindfulness and kind of our stress response come into your practice as far as healing and working with patients? Absolutely. So now that I've been practicing it myself and that I've been teaching my patients these tools and seeing the incredible improvements and the incredible potential of how we can transform ourselves, I, I think back to how is mindfulness just not a part of every routine visit, every healthcare encounter, um, every business, every corporation, because it is truly a transformative evidence-based practice. I know that, uh, you know, in our conversations before this interview, um, you know, we, we had both shared that both for me as a physician and for you, as well as for your audience, it's so important to, to understand and, and practice and apply things that have a great deal of evidence behind them. And so, you know, when you look at mindfulness, there is a great body of research for a number of different conditions that we'll talk about today. Uh, But also even just from personal experience, I think it really was when I started practicing it myself is when I was truly able to effectively use that to help my patients. And I was an internal medicine resident. I was running around the hospital, uh, taking care of inpatients, ICU patients, and, and really trying to do my best to help people, to save people's lives. Uh, But at the same time, I was also pregnant during my residency twice, actually. And I remember hitting a wall and really feeling that I don't don't know if I can do this, like really feeling powerless and feeling, again, we're going to talk a little bit about victimhood and negative self-talk, but definitely feeling a victim of my circumstances, having that negative self-talk, you can't do this, you can't do both of these things, It's, it's too much, you can't take care of your baby that's growing inside you and do this incredibly um, important and difficult job. And, and it was really, I kind of hit this critical point one night when I woke up in the middle of the night and um, was actually just sobbing, thinking like, I have to make a decision now. It's going to be this or that. And, and of course the science nerd that I am, I started, I went on PubMed, um, a, a scientific search engine that I'm sure your audience knows about and started looking up the relationship between stress, shift work, long work hours, and pregnancy. And unfortunately, found a great deal of information about negative pregnancy outcomes as a result of these stressful events. 
And in that moment, just like we have an opportunity right now in the middle of COVID-19 and in the middle of this great uncertainty that we're all facing from both the point of view of our health, but also from the point of view of our life trajectories, finances, and, and, and many different types of crises that, that we're experiencing right now is, is, you know, we have a choice and I had a choice that night and I had a choice to say, I'm a victim. I give up. I can't do this. Or I had a choice to say, you know what, this is a challenge and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to step up to this challenge. I'm going to find the tools to be the best that I can be. I'm going to practice everything I possibly can to be the best, in that case, internal medicine resident that I can be, to be the best mom to be. Um, and so what I started doing is prenatal yoga, which was really my initial introduction to, to a spiritual and a type of mindful practice. I started doing hypnobirthing, which was a type of meditation and hypnosis practice and a guided imagery practice. Uh, I started working with an acupuncturist and a chiropractor to start to prepare my body and my mind for, for labor for the rest of my pregnancy. And all of these experiences over the, the following several months completely transformed how I viewed my situation, how I owned the situation, uh, and also how I reacted to all of these um, circumstances that initially I perceived as overwhelming or as too difficult. And thankfully, gave birth to two healthy babies. And after residency, as I started practicing primary care, I still hadn't fully implemented the mindfulness piece. And so then I did a mindfulness-based stress reduction course myself and started seeing a lot of patients who were suffering from depression, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, chronic pain, inflammation, and who just who felt, and, and, and totally reasonably so, but felt so powerless in their situation and felt that they wanted to do more, but didn't know what to do and how to do it and felt totally overwhelmed. And then I thought, okay, well, let me just try step by step to introduce some mindfulness strategies uh, to introduce some of these techniques for when somebody feels that they're about to experience a panic attack, when they're experiencing certain symptoms or low mood, or when they're wanting to transform their life and their response to their circumstances. And I just started seeing some beautiful, wonderful responses that, again, are backed by the evidence that we're seeing uh, with mindfulness-based stress reduction. And so this really became a tool that I then universally started using with all of my patients that, that can truly be transformative. But the key is that we actually practice it. It's not a magic pill. It's not a magic supplement. It's not, it's a practice. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. What an inspiring, you know, that moment when you woke up in the middle of the night and thought, how am I gonna, like, is this kind of a choice I need to make as far as I can't do both, turning into how can I rise to this challenge and do both mm -hmm. in a way that both supports a healthy pregnancy and allows me to continue on becoming a doctor and think about you know this amazing career that you've had since then um, that could have all maybe not happened if you you know hadn't continued on with your residency. So I love that. I love that kind of pivotal moment that we see with a lot of conventionally trained physicians who are on the show who have that something happening to them, whether they have a chronic Ill illness themselves or this kind of just moment of clarity um, mm -hmm. when they realize that you cannot treat the body separately, that you cannot expect to have good physical health without taking care of the mind. And you cannot expect to, you know, take care of your mind without taking care of your body by doing things like yoga and proper nutrition and, you know, all of that. So um, it's just so intimately connected. I think once people figure that out, it's like they can't go back to mm -hmm. siloing. Um, in no. The way <laughs> so it's like this whole world opens up and this, you know, um, Deepak Chopra and Oprah have these beautiful 21 day meditations. I don't know if you've done uh, any of them. I highly recommend them to anyone out there listening. It's, it's one of my favorite tools. Uh, but Deepak Chopra often, often talks about, you know, the pure potentiality and everything that can be accessed and everything. And it really is true. And a lot of the, um, the doctors that are doing some incredible work in at the intersection of medicine and spirituality, 
it's all about accessing that that pure potential that which we cannot see we cannot touch we cannot feel uh, but it's there and it's and it's there for all of us it's there for anybody out there listening anybody who feels that they've hit their lowest point anybody who feels hopeless it's there we all have this tool within us and and i think that's one of the greatest gifts that we can give ourselves i couldn't agree more and you're making me want to do the 21 day meditations with Deepak Chopra right mm-hmm. now. Um, but anyway, so I want to ask you some questions because I think a lot of people are struggling right now and I think you can help them. I want to start with victimhood because victimhood mm-hmm. is fascinating to me. And I know um, how many people live in a victim mentality without even realizing. And victimhood, I'll let you explain it more. But my brief um, understanding and why it's interesting to me is that because I fell in these stories of health recovery and people with different chronic illnesses um, are part of the well-being community, I see the difference. I see the people that are like, I am going to kick this. I know I've had MS for 20 years, but I, I saw that woman no, you know, has it in remission and I will too. So you know, nothing's gonna stop me. It's just a matter of gathering the tools, just like you did. And then there's others who it's just a total sense of defeat. You know, a total like, you know, this is my life. This is my identity. I will have MS forever. Um, I identify as an MS patient. That is my identity um, and always has been, always will be. Um, like my life stinks. And it's not to say that we shouldn't have empathy, compassion for us, someone living with MS, horrible. It's more that I see this amazing difference. And when I film these stories of health recovery, how much of it is mindset? It's incredible. It's like if you're missing that piece, doesn't matter what food you eat, supplements you take, all of that. The mindset piece is so huge. Um, so could you explain victimhood and how that plays a role in healing and obviously also immunity because immunity is a big part of healing and the connection between victimhood mindset and, and the physical response in the body. Do your best. We could, we could stay on this topic a little while. Sure. Yeah. And I think that you've introduced it very well. I think that you know, when we think of, and you've raised some really important points that I wrote down because I definitely want to get to them and, and elaborate a little bit more and address them. But um, I think that the patterns that you've um, noticed are spot on. I think that, and this is exactly what I see, you know, in my medical practice, what I see even sometimes if I or a loved one falls into that pattern of victimhood, I think that we're all, nobody's immune to it. I think it happens to all of us. But then again, as you said, you know, we can make that choice to say, I'm going to find the tools, I'm going to beat this thing, whatever it is, uh, and I'm just going to continue moving forward. And I think there there are a couple of um, key factors here. One of them that I often notice, um, again, in people that that have a greater tendency to accept the victimhood role and that, um, that are kind of asking the question of why is this happening to me, and then not really taking an active role of what I can do to change, Um, One of the things that we see is number one is the lack of acceptance. So lack of acceptance for our current circumstances, lack of acceptance for ourselves. And I think that a lot of this, again, if we look at it from, you know, cognitive behavioral um, standpoint, we know that our thoughts, right, which we should not be identifying with, we're not our thoughts, right, which again, a lot of victims are their thoughts, but it's important to recognize that, you know what, we can take a step back from that and say, yes, I'm having these thoughts right now and I'm having these feelings right now and I accept them. I fully, fully accept them and accept myself, but I am not this thought. I am not fear or worry or anger. It's something that's clearly needing to come out and needing to get acknowledged and expressed, but it's also not just this one dimension of us. And what we often see is if we're in this kind of negative thought pattern, right, which could be the negative self-talk, the negative mindset, which is basically the opposite of a growth mindset of where we can learn and grow from experiences and really take advantage of neuroplasticity and the fact that we actually can design and grow our brain and grow new pathways. Um, And one of the ways in which we can do that, that is through meditation and mindfulness practices. But one of the ways in which we can also, unfortunately, kind of go the other way as a result of neuroplasticity and things constantly changing is that if we are in that negative self-talk loop and in a victimhood loop, remember neurons that fire together, wire together. If we establish a certain pattern of negative self-talk of this is happening to me, this is 
the more we have those thoughts, the more we will have those thoughts. Because again, that is the pathway of least resistance. This is what is now happening. And so just in the way that we can practice victimhood, we can also practice the opposite and say, okay, let me take a step back. Do I really believe that? Is there another way to look at this story? Is there something else going on? Can I challenge this thought? And so oftentimes what happens when we're in that negative loop to kind of now loop it back to our um, physiology, right? We know, and I'm sure that, you know, you talk about this a lot as well, um, you know, our cortisol and our fight or flight mechanism and, and, and kind of being in that um, uh, mode of activating our fight or flight. And so what happens normally, right? The way that we were, um, the way that we evolved to our benefit is that we have this negative bias and we have this ability to go into a fight or flight state when our life is in danger. So what does that mean? We see that, you know, we're trying to cross the street, we see a car coming, we jump out of the way, or we see a tiger coming towards us, we run. <laughs> or So that fight or flight mechanism is there for a good reason. And I think it's important to acknowledge it and be grateful for it, be grateful for it's there because it actually helped us survive as a species. It helped us survive and make it this far. But at the same time, what happens in the dynamics of our day to day, even before COVID-19, but especially exaggerated during COVID-19, is we're in a constant fight or flight. Well, what happens with that? It means that our cortisol levels are up. It means that our heart rate generally tends to go up when we're in a fight or flight. Our blood pressure goes up. Our focus is certainly not on our digestion. It's certainly not on relaxation and on promoting a positive mindset. It's in a, okay, I'm in danger right now. What do I need to do? And, and we're just kind of waiting for that, you know, for, for something to happen. And so when we're constantly in this fight or flight state, um, and, you know, we talked a little bit before the interview today about some of the, some of the different aspects of our health that can be affected by that. Well, our digestive system is the obvious one. And, you know, you know, many individuals um, that suffer from IBS, one of the things that we know is that when they're under more stressful circumstances, the IBS tends to act up. Whether their tendency is towards diarrhea or constipation, that tendency tends to be even more exaggerated because, again, that very crucial gut-brain connection that's there via the vagus nerve, via the sympathetic nervous system, um, is just not allowing for a optimal digestion for optimal peristalsis or the movement of the food along our intestines. Uh, and it's not allowing for, for a normal digestive process. It basically just goes into a survival mechanism. Um, and that is no longer the priority. So we see exacerbation of conditions under stressful situations that are in part triggered by stress, migraines or headaches, another thing that can be triggered. Um, the natural tendency towards anxiety or panic, again, more triggered because that sympathetic nervous system is ready to fight, it's ready to freeze, or it's ready to run away. And so these are some of the ways and some of the patterns that are um, more exaggerated when we're in this kind of victim, negative self-talk, stressful situation and uncertainty when we allow that to kind of dominate us. I was just thinking of, you know, of course, these are all anecdotal stories that I filmed and by no means completely evidence-based, um, but I think I've filmed about, you know, 30, 40 stories of health recovery at this point from different chronic conditions. And when you were talking about the triggers, I've noticed, you know, in my own kind of trend analysis of mm -hmm. these stories um, is that a lot of times the full-on disease diagnosis um, or big flare up, the big moment that they, you know, realize they have lupus or whatever it is, comes following a very stressful event or a stressful um, time period in their life. One of which was uh, this lupus recovery story we filmed right after she had been a first responder at Ground Zero during September 11th. And of course, that also could have been linked to some of the environmental exposures. But you know, it was almost like her autoimmunity was like a, a bucket filling up, and then the stress just made it like overflow. And as I'm sure, you know, you would say it's a lot harder to reverse a chronic illness than it is to just keep one from 
bubbling over and making that bucket. Absolutely. And yeah. as you pointed out, I completely um, agree with you. And again, this is what we know from research. And this is why it's sometimes really difficult to, to study these cause and effect relationships and also the multifactorial nature of many of the conditions that are in part related to stress, in part related to diet um, and our nutrition profile. Um, because there are so many different factors that have a certain role. And, but then synergistically, they all act together to produce a certain outcome. So, so this is why sometimes, again, it makes it challenging, challenging to study interventions because it's hard to study, for instance, um, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction if you're not also looking at sleep because what does mindfulness do if somebody is sleeping four hours a night or, you know what I mean? And so, so in the same way that, it's, that, it's, um, that it makes it challenging to study these factors together, it's also difficult to know, okay, well, what exactly brought this on. But I agree with you absolutely that oftentimes when we look at the, the first occurrence or when we look at even, uh, you know, uh, conditions that, that relapse, um, go into remission and relapse again, oftentimes it's, there is a stressful trigger. There's something going on in the lives of the individuals that experience that, um, that is promoting uh, that inflammatory response. And we know that, of course, our inflammatory response is actually um, modulated by mindfulness-based stress reduction practices. So um, a couple of the, um, the areas that if you'd like to kind of dive into, uh, I'd love to talk about just because it's so, uh, it's so fascinating to me as a physician to actually see that there are biochemical studies that look at markers, objective markers, um, and then can correlate them back to a mindfulness practice or stress reduction practice. So one of them in particular was in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, um, which of course would be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And, um, and it was one study that uh, randomized people to doing a meditation, mindfulness meditation practice and not doing a mindfulness meditation practice. Um, and they uh, looked at the um, subject's markers over the course of the study and found that inflammatory markers such as CRP, which is C-reactive protein, actually went down in the people that were doing the mindfulness intervention. So that's just one of the ways in which we can, again, quantify and see that effect between, okay, I'm doing a mindfulness practice. What's happening with my physiology? What's happening with my blood markers here? We also know that for people that engage in mindfulness, their gene expression can change, which again, I think is just mind blowing. And some of these genes that are being expressed um, as a result of mindfulness are actually um, uh, genes uh, that are implicated in inflammation. So we'll get less pro-inflammatory genes expressed in people who are meditating versus those who are not. So if we're really looking to reduce the um, inflammation levels, that's one of the pieces of the puzzle that's, again, it's not the whole picture, but it's one of the things that one can do um, to objectively reduce the amount by which these inflammatory products are getting expressed, getting produced. Would you just briefly just give a 30 second, really simple ex uh, explanation of gene expression for anyone who doesn't quite get what that means? Absolutely. So we're all born with a certain genetic material, right? And, uh, and the, the genetic material is packed up very nicely in the nuclei of our cells, right? But what we do know as well is that our genes are not our destiny, right? So we have this genetic material that we're born with. We can't, um, it's not something that we can change. However, not all genes are always turned on, meaning not all of that genetic information that's encoded is always actively going to be what we say call expressed into a protein that then has some type of a function in the cell. So our body very, very carefully regulates what genes are being turned on and off and when and in response to what circumstances. I mean, it's really just a complex, beautiful orchestration of these kind of on and off switches. And so what happens is when a gene is expressed, that genetic information is then ultimately translated to produce some type of a protein from amino acids that are in the cells, the building blocks of protein, and then that protein has some sort of a function. Okay, so back to our topic at <laughs> hand. That was so interesting. Thank you for indulging me um, in that little bit of 
gene science, um, but the act of doing mindfulness-based stress reduction, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'm going to let uh, Boyana explain more about what that actually is in mm -hmm. a second, but me meditation, which people talk about a lot, is one form of um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There's, there's a few others, I believe that's accurate. Um, but uh, the role of that category of activities, which as I said, includes meditation, the role of that on um, gene expression, clearly from the research that you cited, is pretty remarkable. There are so many pieces of this that it relates to. It's not just gene expression. It's also just in yeah. how you feel and how your, your bodily systems function um, and keep you keep you well. But I want to specifically focus on because I know so many people at this time are having issues not only with stress and anxiety from the uncertainty of what's going on with the economy, about their loved ones, about whether they're going to get this incredibly contagious virus, you know, all this mm -hmm. uncertainty and stress that that creates. All of that aside, mm -hmm. a lot of people are home right? Mm -hmm. And dealing with uh, a lot of negative self-talk and mindset about how they're going to handle this situation, right? And not just how are they going to come out of this if their business was impacted, or are they going to come out of this with or without getting coronavirus and how will it impact them when they get it? And then mm -hmm. third, I would say is also what will they do with this experience? You mm -hmm. know, are they exercising enough? Are they eating well? Are they drinking too much? Are they, you know, Con committing to good sleep and enough sleep. And, and I think there can be a ton from what I've seen, even just a few weeks of this, of negative self-talk and self-loathing really, mm -hmm. um, and just a, a mindset issue um, that can then start to um, become the reality as you were beginning to explain a little bit earlier in the interview, as far as their physical health. So if they're beating themselves up because they're not exercising enough or they're drinking too much or they're eating poorly, just chips on the couch instead of real meals or whatever it is, that actually begins to be the state of their body. Their physical health begins to change. So Absolutely. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? And then we'll get into the tools that are actually what you can do to get yourself out of this pattern. Everything is exaggerated. So if somebody has insomnia, and like you pointed out that one day that you were watching the news all day, you had insomnia. But if somebody has insomnia, insomnia may get exaggerated. If somebody has irritable bowel syndrome, that will get exaggerated. If somebody um, has, you know, not such nourishing eating practices, or maybe they tend to, to emotionally eat, well, this is certainly going to exacerbate that. Or if somebody is more prone to anxiety, to panic attacks, Again, this time is the perfect storm for that to flourish um, because if, if we are not using any tools to maintain or to counteract or just as I, what I like to say sometimes is to channel that, to challenge, to, to channel and redirect rather than, you know, we're not trying to suppress anything. We're not trying to ignore anything, but it's important to acknowledge and then channel it the right way. So I think that any chronic conditions uh, are more likely to be exacerbated in this situation if we're, or any symptoms, in fact, if we're not using the right tools right now. And then some of the, the tools that I, that I like to start with, and again, just because most of the research really has been done on mindfulness-based stress reduction, I can define that, and then we can go into the different aspects of that and into the different um, effects of that. So mindfulness-based stress reduction is a tool that was developed by John Kabat-Zinn, uh, back in the 1970s. And John Kabat-Zinn um, is um, actually at the time, uh, he you know, was getting his PhD at MIT in molecular biology, uh, but also was a Buddhist monk and was somebody who really was able to translate this Buddhist practice into the Western world so that people of any religion or no religion at all or any, any culture, any, any sort of spiritual beliefs could practice it in a way that was safe and not counteracting maybe any other belief systems and whatnot. And then he also, what was really important to him being a PhD is that research be done on this. And one of the places that this was initially started was the Massachusetts General Hospital, where he initially, from what I read, initially had um, the department heads of the different departments and specifically, I know there were heart disease patients and, and, and basically wanted the sickest patients to come and attend these mindfulness-based stress reduction sessions and then assess 
how their quality of life and how their symptoms were affected by mindfulness-based stress reduction over time. And this is really where some of this research originated. And since then, it's been both practiced and studied at a number of academic institutions all over the world, but also has been made accessible by, you know, in many of the cities, as well as now, especially with COVID-19 online. And I really just have to say that it's so touching and, and wonderful to see. I follow a lot of the different meditation groups and do a lot of the meditations online. And I'm really just so touched. And I think it's such a great service to people that a lot of these apps and a lot of these groups are providing free resources for people so that, you know, you don't have that other stressor to worry about, but can really access these tools, especially if it's really hard for you, if somebody is either beginning to do it, or if somebody is kind of trying to get back into it and is having a hard time motivating to just sort of plus play and, and listen and, and ease into it. Um, and so what mindfulness-based stress reduction really is, is let's, let's break it down. So, so what is mindfulness? The way that mindfulness is defined is that it's a practice of being in the present moment and really being fully engaged with what is going on right now in this moment. So it's not about worrying about the past or thinking about the future. It's about the right now. And the way in which we engage in this present moment is, is such that we're paying attention on purpose. And so what that means is that we're purposefully or intentionally paying attention to what is around us. So maybe we're noticing the different objects in the room that we're sitting in. Maybe we're paying attention to the feelings that are coming up for us. Maybe we're paying attention to that, to those aches and pains that we've had. So it really could be paying attention in this moment with anything that is present for us, physically or non-physically. And the other key component is doing so without judging. And now this is the impossible part. So what I often talk about when I, when I talk about the no judgment is that I think that we have to acknowledge the amount of judging and the amount of thoughts that we have every day. So studies show that we have somewhere between 50 and 70,000 thoughts a day and that over 90% of these thoughts are repeat offenders, right? So we talked earlier about neurons that fire together, wire together. So we get into habitual thoughts. And if it's, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, or I'm never going to um, figure this out, or I'll never be able to repair this relationship, or I'll never change this habit. I've tried so many times and I just can't do it. I can't do it. That's just a thought that's being reinforced. It's not actually you. It's, it's really just a thought that's being reinforced whose pattern can be broken. And then the second piece to having those repeat thoughts is acknowledging that we're constantly judging. So a study by Princeton psychologists was done where they showed people um, photos of different, they showed subjects photos of different people. And they found that, that subjects made judgments about these people within a fraction of a second. I mean, we're constantly judging, you know, this is, I like this, I don't like that. I believe this, I don't believe it. You know, whatever it might be, we're constantly making these judgments. So acknowledging that, okay, we're going to have a lot of thoughts. So mindfulness or meditation is not about suppressing thoughts or not having thoughts. I think that's one of the biggest myths that I often hear holds people back is, well, I, I just can't, like, I, I just can't sit there with no thoughts. I can't not think. And I can, and that's not what mindfulness is at all. It's in fact about embracing all these things and getting curious. And then the judgment piece, again, it's impossible, but what is possible is that we can say, okay, I'm judging. I'm judging myself right now for, let's say, making a choice to um, eat this chocolate bar instead of having an apple or whatever, or I'm judging myself for thinking negatively about the future. Um, we can say, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm judging myself. I'm being really cruel and mean to myself right now. Or is that judgment trying to tell me something? Is that judgment trying to make me even better and maybe rise to this challenge? So just taking a little step back, and, and really getting curious about the thoughts and the judgment is really that crucial component of mindfulness besides being in the now and paying attention to the now. You know, if we formally study mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, typically 
there's, there's a structured course and it's a wonderful course that I would really highly, highly recommend. Um, and I've had patients do um, incredible, I've taken this course myself, but I've also um, had and heard of incredible stories with this besides the research that was done of depression, just being complete, people getting the tools and the resources that they need so that they can cope with their depression in a way that they, that they weren't able to before because it was so overpowering. Um, or using this as a way to, um, to alleviate panic attacks. I've heard of stories of, of people who are suffering from cancer um, or who you know, may have a very uh, negative diagnosis using mindfulness-based stress reduction to really be in their body rather than dissociating from, from feeling the burden of disease, actually being in there, feeling it, and, and actually having some therapeutic alleviating effect from that. Um, and of course, if, if one is embarking on it, the best way to do it is to do a structured course. But a simple exercise that anyone can do at home is what we call the body scan. And there are online meditations that, that one can do to follow that. But what it really is, is to really just start to notice our body piece by piece and to really get in touch and to get connected with the now. Because the more that we're connected with the now, the more that we're the more we're present and grounded and not up here with the thoughts. Because that thought of anxiety and that thought of is essentially a sensation of groundlessness. And we, we don't have anything to anchor ourselves and, and we need that anchor. Um, and so it's a beautiful tool for that. But of course, there are a number of different kinds of meditations, um, whether they're guided ones like the one I mentioned before with Deepak Chopra and Oprah, or there's the Calm app that also does guided meditations, um, or a number of different apps. Um, or it could just simply be a breathing meditation where we're just sitting with our breath and focusing on that. And that's the object of our focus. Or some people have mantras. Mantra meditation is great. And then just mantra uh, is the, the object of that focus. But there are so many different ways to achieve um, a very similar effect. And what I often tell my patients is that there's no one size fits all. And we really have to find what we respond to. And so if you try one type of meditation with one instructor or with one style and you say, oh, I can't do it. This is not for me. Don't stop. Try another one. Find, look around until you find something that resonates because something will eventually resonate. So many things that you said mm -hmm. resonated with me, but um, I started my meditation practice probably two or three years ago and started with, you know, like a lot of people, an app, you know, I started with Headspace and then I moved to 10% Happier and it was like, okay, you know, it's, it's almost like maybe being in your first relationship. You're like, right, right. Okay. You know, you don't know any different. Um, and then you eventually sort of realize this is not really uh, something that I want to do. You know, it feels kind of like a chore or I'm going through the motions. I'd spoken to somebody who said the same thing you did, which was you got to keep trying different things. And I really actually would say interject that just from from a healing perspective, that's what I tell people, you know, whenever I do actually some private consult on the patient advocacy side is, you know, functional medicine, holistic approach to healing, just because you tried one of thousands of therapies or one of thousands of practitioners or doctors trained in this, and they didn't figure out your problem or that didn't work to heal your migraines, et cetera, keep trying. You will find it. You have to keep trying. You know, you can't give up on something because you tried one version of thousands. Um, mm -hmm. And it's apparently certainly true for meditation as well. So I worked, I ended up working with a coach or I took a class rather. It was an in-person class um, in New York and uh, he had a very different approach. He was like an ex-corporate lawyer turned meditation teacher, wow. um, had been in corporate law for about 10 years, I think, um, before he did that. And really his, his approach resonated much more with me. Now I've fallen off a bit. So I'm kind of thinking maybe I need to try an even, you know, different time. approach, yeah. keep going, keep, you know, improving. Um, but it definitely changed from feeling like a chore to something that my body appreciated. Like, the feeling of getting into a warm shower is kind of how I, uh, you know, nobody gets into a warm that. shower yeah. and is like, oh, I don't want to be yeah. here. Like yeah. the second you feel that hot water hit your shoulder, you're like, oh, this is yes. Um, And the same is true for this meditation that I'm doing now versus when I used an app. It was just kind of like, eh, 
you know, whatever. Um, whereas uh, now I resist because the thoughts in my head are, you have to do this, you have to do that, you don't have enough time. Oh, it's not as effective if you only do five minutes, da, 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 you know, all this. And I sort of have to just, and then I begin and within a minute or two, it's like the hot shower effect. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, it feels nice. Totally agree. Yeah. So, okay. So just because I think I could talk to you about this forever, and I know you have a busy day, um, but I want to make sure that people fully understand kind of, you you explained what mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR is so well. And I love the origin of John Kabat-Zinn being a biologist at MIT Mm -hmm. and, you know, also a Buddhist monk. I mean, sounds like the coolest Mm -hmm. guy ever, but um, how that uh, had such an impact and was, has been studied and, and so connected to, to, uh, health outcomes. I know you've talking to, you just spoke about meditation quite a bit and different kinds of meditation, but is that really what you think of as mindfulness? I mean, are there any other tools within mindfulness besides meditation that you, you know, prescribe to patients or use with patients? Absolutely. I think we can be mindful when we're doing anything, you know, we can be, I remember when I did the mindfulness based stress reduction class, Um, one of the instructions that our instructor gave to us, she was like an MD, PhD turned mindfulness instructor. It's so fascinating how there there are all these multi-talented people out there teaching this. But one of the instructions she gave us was, you know, do one mindful thing every day. So she said, if you're having a hard time practicing this every day, do it while you're brushing your teeth. So we can all be mindful when we're doing something that we're going to do twice a day. I hope everyone. (laughs) And just being in this moment of checking in with yourself, saying, how am I doing right now? Feeling, literally feeling the sensation of the toothbrush and feeling what what that's like for you. We can be mindful while we're eating. We can commit to, especially now that we're eating at home, we can commit to, you know, closing our computers, turning off the news, having one mindful meal a day, every day. And I have a video on this as well in case somebody wants to really follow along. But all this means is that, and there's a beautiful practice with a raisin actually, and a mindfulness eating exercise with a raisin. But all it means is just kind of letting everything else go, focusing on the smell of your food, focusing on the look, the texture, the taste, and just enjoying it, just taking your time. And if you're you know, if you're social distancing alone, doing it on your own, if you're social distancing with a partner, with a family, you can all eat mindfully together, maybe not engaging in any intense conversations, but just really mindfully engaging with your meal. So there are a number of things that we can do um, every single day. There's actually even a walking mindful meditation. So, um, you know, and and we could even do this indoors. Again, um, you could be very intentionally taking steps one by one, very slowly, and being mindful about your walking. And these are some of the exercises that we used to do in the MBSR class of literally just walking very slowly and just feeling the sensations on your foot. And it's really incredible how practicing where we're putting our attention, again, if we do it consistently, how that then spills over into other areas of our lives. And so then when that negative self chatter starts again, we can say, okay, I I hear you. Thank you. I appreciate it for trying to protect me. I think that's a really important piece. Again, acknowledgement and acceptance, but I choose to focus my attention here right now and really owning that and really knowing that, you know, I choose to do this right now is so important. So we can walk, we can brush teeth, we can eat, We could do a number of activities mindfully, but I think that setting up our days is also going to help us be more intentional and more mindful. So from, you know, from getting at least eight hours of sleep every night to then starting every morning with journaling, I've I've started to use something called a five minute journal actually just very recently. And I love it. I have to say I was kind of an on and off journaling person anyway. And, you know, again, there are studies on journaling and how it's extremely helpful for stress, for the right mindset. But what I like about the five minute journal is that it literally takes five minutes or less. And that can be a mindful practice because we're doing what we're doing is reflective. It's intentional. And we're writing down what we're grateful for. What would make today great? 
what is my daily affirmation? Meaning, what do I, what do I believe in? What do I believe is helpful to me right now? And then reflecting on three great things that happened today. What could have made today even better? So again, we're focusing our attention very intentionally and kind of sneakily to highlight all of the positives. Um, and I think, again, anybody can do that. And, you know, for people that feel like, you know what, this is too much. Like, do I do breathing? Do I do MBSR? Do I walk? Do I, you know, just do one thing at a time. And when you feel like you've got it, maybe a week into it or whenever you feel like you're ready, add on that next step. Because it's all about building these micro steps and building a consistency and a routine that's going to continue to reinforce these positive patterns. Yeah, I, I think in my own life and what I tell people when they ask me about any sort of lifestyle or behavior change, when it is so routine or comes so naturally as brushing your teeth when you first get up, I'm very routine about a, you know just a handful of things in the morning and it's brushing my teeth, brushing my hair, you know, having like water with some fresh lemon. So Mm -hmm. I've sort of thought of, you know, it's easy for all of us to get overwhelmed by all the things that we should be doing. Like you said, like, should we be mindfully walking, journaling? Should we be meditating? Like there's just, and and, you know, you also have to deal with your children, get Mm -hmm. to work, you know, all that stuff. Um, And so I've kind of now gone to the other side, as you're saying, which is just start with one thing until it's as routine as brushing my teeth. And then once it's, ingrained and in my pattern, right? Like my body is now programmed to do this thing. It's no longer an effort. Then maybe I could incorporate something else. But also taking the time to realize the impact it's having on you before you move on to something else, um, I think is great because it's like a positive feedback loop. Um, I think about this with my own business too. Like I'll finish a big project or, you know, run, ran my program with, uh, you know, a certain number of participants and it was over. And I am now realizing, I am telling myself that, you know, this half of my body or half of my brain that's going run, run, run to the next thing. There's so many things you need to be doing is saying, no, please be quiet for a second. Um, I am choosing to focus on what I just accomplished over the last three months and how much work that was um, and that I need to give myself some acknowledgement, some celebration and some rest from that, some mental rest for at least a couple you know, days or whatever it might be before I go plugging into the next thing, because I'm going to run out of gas on the next thing if I don't uh, do this. So I think the same can be true for introducing mindfulness tools, as you were saying, is ignore the side of your brain that's either saying, get to work, you have so much to do, or sleep a little longer, or, you know, lie in bed with Instagram, or if you're a major self-improver, like, us, I think, um, do the 75 different, you know, yeah. self-care techniques yeah. before you start yeah. your day. Um, all of that, just, just, just thank you very much for your opinion, but no, I'm not listening to you this morning. Um, and I'm just going to do this one thing well until mm-hmm. I reach a point where it's routine and then can also take the time to say, it's, it's making me feel good or it's making me stress less, or I feel somehow a difference in my body, um, or I'm sleeping better, or I feel I have less anxious thoughts or whatever the improvement that you can track. If if you feel there's no improvement, keep going. You know, you're not, you're not there yet. Um, As Boyana said, the science is there that it does make an impact. Um, So it's just a matter of continuing on that practice. Um, And so I love that. Yeah. And one thing that you just said, I love because, you know, sometimes we tend to label things good or bad. And so I'll hear people and I used to do this myself say, oh, I had a good meditation or a bad meditation, or I'm not good at meditating. And again, it's another myth. There's no good or bad. We all have days that are, you know, easier or more challenging, but just the act of showing up, the act of sitting there and doing something or or walking, walking meditation, but just the act of showing up, doing it and showing that intention is going to result in change over time. It will. So whether we feel that it was good or feel that it was bad, just detach from it. And I know it's easier said than done, but just practice that detachment. And again, acceptance of, oh, this is what is showing up for me right now. There's a reason for that. 
I love that. Well, I have kept you so long um, because this topic is so timely and interesting to me. Um, and you're just a wealth of knowledge on all kinds of science. Thank you for <laughs> indulging me in the gene expression talk. Um, but before we go, this one question that I ask every expert that is on the show, because you know so much and there's so many different things that you can be doing for yourself, right? How do you get well be, as we say? Um, and that is the absolute can't miss sort of wellness practice or thing that you do every day, um, no matter how busy you are, if you're traveling, if you're home, whatever. And it could be two things, three things, but really just like your foundation of health. I get well-being by sleeping at least eight hours a night. So when we sleep enough and when we nourish our body with sleep, we're more likely to be focused, attentive the next day. Our memory is better. Our cognitive performance is better. Our relationships are better. Our immunity is better. We didn't get to a study, but there's a super, I don't know if you know about this study, but they inoculated people with a type of a respiratory virus. It was not COVID-19, but it was a respiratory virus. They inoculated people's nostrils with it actually, and uh, or nasal passages, I should say. And then they quarantined them. They found that people that were sleeping more than seven hours a night were four times or more than four times less likely to get the symptoms of a common cold that this virus causes compared to people that slept less than five hours a night. So not only do we get all these amazing cognitive and emotional benefits from sleep, not to mention mood and so on, but also we get the immune benefits from sleep. And when we're more rested, we're more likely to organize our day and structure things so that we can meditate, we can exercise, we can make healthy eating choices, right? Because sleep affects our hormones that regulate our appetite. So it all, like everything that we talk about or could talk about goes back to sleep. So I would say eight hours of sleep at least. It's great to bring it back to immunity given everything we're going through, but sleep is so is the foundation of health as I think a lot of people say, or healthy behavior, right? Like if you sleep well and sleep enough, everything that you do during the day is going to be better. There's just no way that that's not true, whether it's what you decide to eat or how much you decide to move or, you know, sticking to a mindfulness or meditation practice, et cetera. I love that. And just also how you make other people feel in your life and how you might talk to yourself. And we all know how grumpy and snappy you can be on a bad night's sleep. Apart from the, the, the physical aspects of your own health and mental health, how you interact with the world because you don't know who else is having a terrible day. And if you're grumpy or snappy with them, um, that just has a cascading effect on you know the whole world. So I love Absolutely. that. Boyana, thank you so, so much. Um, I you. know that this has <laughs> gone a little longer, but I just loved having you and getting to pick your brain for all kinds of interesting information. And I just love your story going from you know an internal medicine residency and, and eventual, you know, uh, medical school and training to seeing this uh, tremendous impact of both mindfulness and integrative medicine and, and how you've been able to in incorporate that into your practice in New York City and, you know, I think at this point virtually as well. So where can people find more of you? Absolutely. So they can find me at drboyana.com, which is drboyana.com. Uh, and um, I actually offer a free meditation guide. So for anybody that's interesting, they're more than welcome to enter their information on the website. They get a free meditation guide and they'll also be getting some more information about free meditation resources and just other ways to promote healthy habits. So plenty of tools that I love to share and that, again, I know from evidence, but also from trying them myself, that they actually work and are effective and are worthwhile sharing. Well, thank you so much again. Bye. Stay safe, stay healthy. And um, I know that you've just volunteered uh, to help with the current coronavirus crisis, which is um, tremendous. And I thank you for it on behalf of all people. I know you haven't been called up yet, but if you do before you know, I get to talk to you next or before this interview airs, thank you. And uh, we all appreciate your sacrifice and your help. Thank you so much for having me.